Hey, Josh Felber here. Just wanted to dive in today. We got some really cool insights for you. Sales is all around us, whether we're selling in our company, whether we are trying to buy a car, we're trying to get the best deal. So we got to sell why we need to get the best deal. Anything that we do, there's sales always around us. So today's guest is going to drop some amazing insights um, that give you the seven steps that he utilizes to sell. And whether you're on the phone, whether you're in person, what any area of sales, he's going to be able to help you out. So check out today's episode with Cole Gordon. It's going to really blow your mind and give you some amazing insights on sales. Also, guys, if you love any of this freedom gear, gratitude gear, anything like that, they have the softest clothing. Majority of it's made in the USA, and they have really cool sayings, logos, and a lot of great merch. So like me, I wear it, gratitudegear.com. Go check out gratitudegear.com and grab your stuff today. You can use Making Bank 10 for 10% off. Use Making Bank 10 for 10% off. All right, guys. See you on the other side. One of my mentors told me, you know, selling is really, uh, you're not really selling your product. You're selling them on a way of thinking, right? And so like when I sell, I just try to get them to think the right way to where by the nature of thinking, the way I want them to think, buying the product is a natural byproduct of that way of thinking. Next up, representing Primal Life Organics, Josh Making Bank Felber. Welcome to Making Bank. I'm Josh Felber, where we uncover the mindset and the success strategies of the top 1% so you can amplify your life and your business today. Super excited for today's guest. Cole Gordon started out by being one of the top closers in the high ticket industry, having sold over 10 million in online coaching, consulting, and agency deals within a few years of his career. He then scaled his own consulting company to over eight figures in less than one and a half years, 18 months. <laughs> now he builds, trains, and consults the sales teams of hundreds of seven and eight figure companies online through his company, Closers.io, having worked with teams like Tony Robbins, Frank Kern, Eric Heck, and others. So super excited to welcome Cole Gordon to Making Bank today. Happy to be here, man. Excited to be here. Cool, brother. Uh, so I guess... This, how did you get started in, I guess, as an entrepreneur and then kind of moved into sales? Yeah. So five years ago, I was just finishing up college. I was bartending. I was a manager of a bar, just partying, basically. And, uh, you know, I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. So I uh, was going to go to medical school. I was, I was a really good student. I mean, I was bartending and not making any money, but I was a 4.0 student. And uh, I was going to go to medical school because I thought that was like how you made money and were successful. Like I had that type of upbringing to where like sure. lawyer, doctor type of thing was, was the success. And, 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 but at the same time, my parents always told me, you know, you could do whatever you wanted to. And I think that stuck with me. So I, I just, I, I remember one bar shift while all the students were gone. Cause I was, I was, I was, I was uh, managing a college bar. I was reading this book and this book really had a profound effect on me and really just kind of shifted my paradigm to becoming an entrepreneur opposed to going down kind of the traditional route. I just sort of knew it in my core uh, mm -hmm. as I was reading that. It was like an eight hour shift. Nobody was there. I just crushed the book in one sitting. And then uh, from there, I, I started, you know, I, I basically dropped out of the whole med school process of things, got started as a, um, you know, wanted to start an online business. So back then, like blogging was really big and SEO. Right. So, you know, I tried to do that. I was like miserable at it. Uh, just literally no, no success whatsoever. And then I uh, started to, you know, I was buying courses, I was reading all the books, I was trying to get mentors. And then I kind of fell into like the Facebook ads agency thing. And that's where I had some initial success. So I probably grew that to about $30,000 a month, but I just totally sucked at everything and was like, I did suck at the sales, but I, I sucked the least at it, you know, surprisingly. And so, and a lot of people actually have the opposite, opposite thing. Right. They're like really good at a lot of things. They just suck at the you know, they really stink at sales. I was bad at everything, but I pretty, I, I stunk the, the least worst at sales, but I kind of ascribed my identity to being this great sales guy. Cause I thought that was what my talent was. Cause I was better at that than everything else. 
And so um, I got really burned out of the company just because I didn't know how to run a company. I didn't even know how to get my clients' results, to be honest. Like I was just this young kid trying to make money. So I, I gave my clients away to a guy who was much more experienced than I. And I um, joined a team as a high ticket closer. And, you know, to my surprise, I was actually the worst. I mean, I was the worst, not only the worst closer on the team, I had to have been like the worst closer in existence. I was really bad. And I just worked at it really hard and stuck with it. I had, well, one thing I did have was a great work ethic. And over the course of a year, and I had great team members too, and a great coach. So over the course of the year, I went from like the worst guy to one of, if not the best guys in that first team, left that, went to another team, was immediately the best on that team. And then I went to another team called Traffic and Funnels, where I spent a year there and was the best guy there and did, did really, really well as, as the company was also kind of exploding into like an eight figure, multiple eight figure territory, which was very new for coaches, consultants, and agencies and such at that time. So that was a tremendous experience just to be a part of that growth, as well as to develop my sales abilities and kind of be a leader on the sales team and in the company in general, which was really, really cool. I'm really, really grateful for that experience. And then after I left that, I started a sales training company. So I started doing some one-on-one -on -one sales coaching, then I was training sales teams. And then after that, I uh, started doing sales recruiting. And that's really when the business took off. And I you know, went from about 100K a month level to two and a half million a month, right? Not just because it's sales recruiting, but it was an offer that was a big enough problem with a large enough market segment. And then I also you know, finally dialed in marketing. I got the right people on my team. We built the right systems. And so now we have, I think about 90-ish people. It's hard to kind of keep track nowadays, but we have about 90-ish people. We're, we're pretty steady at about two and a half million a month cash. So that's not like Fugazi revenue contracts. That's just, you know, like, cash in the bank. And uh, we're really profitable, really grateful. I have great clients and, you know, we're looking to get to a hundred million is the goal. So that's the story. That's awesome. Kind of, you know, as you were making that transition in the sales and then starting to learn, what were you think were some of your kind of key attributes or things? Why, why you either picked it up real easily or why that, um, you know, what made it, you know, why you connected really with it to be good at it? Yeah, well, I definitely wasn't good in the beginning. I was really right. bad. The one thing I always had for me was a really strong work ethic. So I, what, what really had me going for it is that a lot of other guys on the team, uh, even if they were a lot better than me, they still had a little bit of a job mentality. And, and some of it was they were using their sales career, or their sales job as a stepping stone to the next thing, which nothing wrong mm. with that, but they were doing that. Or they were, uh, you know, doing uh, the sales to make money, but they kind of had like a side hustle going on at the same time. What I decided to do was just go full tunnel vision and just really optimize every minute of my, around my day of becoming the best I possibly could be at sales. And sales is really hard, like to really kind of just fully dedicate yourself to it and review a ton of your calls, all of that stuff. It's, you know, it, it does take a full bandwidth. So not only did I obviously take the maximum amount of calls I took that were generated inbound, not only did I prospect a bunch and self-set, but at the same time, I was reviewing a ton of my calls, both my wins and my losses, which is really important. Just as an athlete breaks down game tape, a salesperson needs to break down their own game tape. So I was constantly reviewing and trying to get better. And I was going through tons of trainings and courses and I was hiring coaches. And so and I invested a ton into myself. And then I'd say the final thing is as well, is that... Um, I, I finally kind of, this sounds so common sense now, but you know, back then I was probably like 24. And so I was kind of partying a little bit and, you know, I, sometimes I stay up late and some days I wouldn't. And when I really started to treat selling in my profession, like I was a professional athlete to where like every day I got to wake up and play the game every day. And I got to make sure my energy's right. My body's right. My health's right. My focus is right. My, I don't have brain fog that I got the right night of sleep. And I started to get, you know, eight and a half hours or nine and a half hours of sleep and started eating really well. Believe it or not, that was bar none, the biggest thing that I did, which sounds so like, duh, you know? And, and now I'm <laughs> like, well, okay. Like, what do you, what do you know? But back then I was like, you know, a 24 year old kid, I was partying, I was you know, drinking, I was chasing girls, I was living in Nashville, Tennessee. So I just wasn't doing any of that stuff. And when I really started to like, take care of myself in those ways, that's when I started to be consistent. Because before that, I'd have really ups and I have downs. Then mm -hmm. I started to get consistent because I had at that point, this was like probably six or seven months into my selling career, I had the talent. I just didn't have like the discipline. And then when, I, when you get both of those together is when you start to do really good. And then it's just about getting, uh, you know, just, just working at it more and trying to gain every little inch you can to get better. No, it's, uh, there's actually some you know, really good things. I mean, obviously, taking care of yourself, 
you know, obviously, like you said, it seems like it should be the normal. Like, oh, hey, this is <laughs> I got to feel better to be better. But, you know, a lot of times, like you said, we don't we don't realize that may be the one thing or one of the biggest things holding us back, you know, from success. Yeah, 100 percent. I would say the other thing, because, you know, just for the listeners, you know, hearing that type of advice isn't necessarily groundbreaking. It's pretty basic. Just to give them something a little bit more tactical. What I also discovered around that time, and I didn't do this, this will sound like something I'm like, you know, came up to market with. But it, I, I really just, this was how I thought of sales after doing thousands and thousands of sales calls. Is what happened was when I was like the worst guy on the team, I was always listening to the end of the sales calls of the best guys on the team. And I'd always expect to hear a bunch of objections and crazy objection handling and like all of this stuff. And I actually heard the opposite. I heard no objections and basically the prospect enrolling themselves, right? And right then and there, I knew that, okay, well, it seems as if basically it is not the objection handling and the verbal judo you're doing at the end of the call that makes the difference. It's really what you're doing all before that, which if anybody's mm-hmm. experienced in sales, like they're like, okay, like, duh. So what I sort of believed is that, okay, well, like how can I reverse engineer an objectionless close? Because that's what these best closers are doing. So how can I have the conversation in such a way where by the end of the call, they're basically enrolling themselves instead of me having the hard pressure and hard close them, they're you know, looking at me as a leader and an advocate and authority, and they're basically enrolling themselves into whatever I'm selling. And what I discovered is that there's basically seven beliefs the prospect needs to have to buy. Okay. There's pain, doubt, cost, desire, money, support, trust. So pain is that they have a problem. Doubt is they have a doubt that they can fix the problem. Cost is they have, uh, basically, if, if the problem leaves unfixed, the cost or the consequences of leaving that problem unfixed is far greater than the consequences in terms of investing time, energy, money, reputation, et cetera, into doing your offer. And then desire is the compelling payoff that they get when they fix the problem. Support is basically do the people around them, spouse, partner, business, you know, board, whatever, support them in fixing the problem. And trust is Basically, do they trust your method or your specific methodology in fixing the problem? Do they believe that your solution is going to be the simultaneous explanation of why everything they tried in the past has failed and why this is going to be different. Okay. And so when you get those seven things, what happens is each one of those ties to one or more objections. So if you get those seven things and you really actually nail them, the only thing you can be left to left at the end of the call with is just logistics. That's it. Mm. And so, and it's easy to work through logistics when they really want to do it. We're just trying to make a way to get creative, to make the finances work or timing. That's, that's pretty easy because we're on the same side of the table. They really want to do it. But if you don't have those seven, they each kind of have a counter objection that will show up at the end of the call. So that's what I teach now. I mean, we've taught probably, I don't know, you know, I I would imagine over 10,000 salespeople at this point, I could figure it out, but several, uh, a lot. And, um, and that is the methodology that we teach. And I, I've always been told it's very process oriented and kind of systematic. And that's very nice for somebody who, you know, is not this natural extrovert, so to speak. Sure. And I mean, through that process and to discover what those different seven keys are, uh, you guys are then asking them different types of questions to kind of lead them for you to get that information. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the way you elicit those beliefs is you get the prospect to actually speak them. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you want to have a, you want to have your sales process basically in a way where you're at, you're using Socratic dialogue, you're asking skilled questions to get the prospect basically telling you all of the things that you want, you know, you want them to essentially tell them all of the things that kind of instill those seven beliefs and create consistency, right? In the book Influence by Bravo Cialdini, uh, he mm-hmm. talks about consistency bias being the number one driver of human behavior is to appear consistent, consistency bias, right? So when we can, if you get those seven things and you can get the prospect to speak those into existence, a lot of the times they're, they're basically becoming consistent with enrolling in your offer as long as you position it correctly. No, that's great. What were some of the hardest things for people to, as you're training them, to either learn or to, what? Like, what is that big hurdle a lot of times when you're teaching somebody in sales? Yeah, well, you know, and most people want to think it's tactical, but, you know, in most cases, it's really just conviction, belief. It's Mm, also their belief around selling. Do they think selling is evil? Do they think it's bad? Uh, It's their inability to be assertive, you know, like you don't have to necessarily be an assertive person, like to where you're just this like stereotypical salesperson, but you need to be like firm. You need to be somebody who 
can be their advocate for them. When I say be their advocate for them, I don't mean just be like their cheerleader, but sometimes you got to be somebody who can give them, you know, and sometimes like a stern talking to, you just got to be, you got to be honest with people just because it's the best thing for them. And that's not every time I'm not saying you're coming on being this like hardcore salesperson, but you know, you, you, you have to be honest with the prospect and you have to really get them to think the right way. Uh, like one of my mentors told me, you know, selling is really, uh, you're not really selling your product. You're selling them on a way of thinking. Right. And mm. so like when I sell, I just try to get them to think the right way to where by the nature of thinking the way I want them to think buying the product is a natural byproduct of that way of thinking, you know? So a lot of it though right. is, is a lack of assertiveness or uh, belief or limiting beliefs about sales. Like that is the hardest stuff to work towards. If I have somebody who has all those innate talents, I can always train them up on the tactics. I mean, it's very right. easy, but a lot of it is the beliefs and the mindset and the character traits. And also just like, you know, if you have a no show, okay, do you hit the phones, you prospect, you try to self set, you hit your pipeline, you try to make something of that hour. Or do you just like go on a siesta and, you know, get a sandwich? <laughs> so it, yeah, part of it's the discipline and the character traits as well. Awesome. Hey guys, I hope you guys are really paying attention to what Cole's talking about today. I mean, everything from when he was first learning, listening to his calls, like it's, it's like if you've ever played any kind of sports or anything like back and you go back and you're watching those tapes to see what your opponent does or before a game and things like that. He did that same thing as he was learning as well as listening to his mentors calls and how they were closing and how that, and you know, the last part of that call for him to really figure out what are they doing? How are they doing? And then creating this whole process of selling to make it simple and easy. So go back, listen, watch this again. Make sure you guys take those notes and then start to apply those if you're doing any kind of selling. We're selling every day, whether we realize it or not. I mean, whether we're going down and buying something at the local store to if we're jumping on the phone, talking to somebody and we want to have them invest in our business or whatever that may be. So what's uh, one thing you're like, oh man, I hope Josh was going to ask me something like this, but he didn't ask me this question today. You just want to let everybody know before we wrap up. One, one question. Uh, well, man, yeah, or anything I, you want to let somebody know before we wrap up. I don't know. Oh, here, here's one thing I'll say. This is a very counterintuitive piece of advice for entrepreneurial podcast. You know, I know when I was younger, I used to listen to a bunch of podcasts and I just kind of was lost. You know, I was consuming a lot of information. I was listening to the, the Lewis Howes and the Gary V's and all these guys. But I was like, what do I do? You know, and I just want to give somebody, you know, who's in that same situation as me that I was five, six, seven years ago some advice on what to do, like practical steps. Number one, what I would do is find an industry you're passionate about. You probably already know that. Like maybe you're into real estate, maybe you're into digital marketing, maybe you're into coaching. I mean, just find the industry that you're naturally gravitating towards anyways. Maybe it's crypto nowadays, whatever it is. Find the thing that you're naturally gravitating towards, number one. Then number two, get a job working for the company who's like top dog in that industry. And honestly, just try to get in with whatever you can get in at. If you got to be the janitor, be the janitor, you know, but just try to be, get in and then just absolutely obliterate that position. Like just be the God's best at it. Okay. Just dominate it. You know, if you're going to be a janitor, be, just be the best janitor in the freaking world. Okay. And then from that, those two, really what you're doing is what Robert Greene talks about in mastery is you're sort of entering into an apprenticeship. And I, I really believe if you get in a in, into a company that is an industry you're passionate about, and you get around, it's a, it's a new, fast-growing company. It's usually like more of a startup phase. And you have some good mentors within the company, if not the founder. There's nothing that's going to accelerate your growth as much as something like that will. And you're going to learn, you're going to get paid to learn a tremendous amount that you basically would have had to learn through mistakes otherwise. So I do think that would help a lot for a lot of folks who are really beginning in their journey and just kind of lost on what to do. For sure. No, that's definitely some great insights. Uh, where can people get more information on you, what you got going on, follow you? Yeah, closers.io uh, is our website. Closers.io, not close, closers. And then other than that, if you type in Cole Thomas Gordon on Instagram, I think you'll find me there. It's kind of a fun, we, we post a lot of like memes and stuff. It's, 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 it's a good page. I think people, people tend to enjoy it, but people can follow me there as well. Awesome. Oh, cool. Uh, thanks again for coming on Making Bank, sharing some insights on selling today, and just really appreciate your time. Awesome, man. Thank you. I am Josh Felbert. You are watching Making Bank. Get out and be extraordinary.